The Secret of Secrets Translation from the Arabic by A. S. Fulton Read by Dan Attrell Part 1 In the name of God, the Merciful, the Compassionate, may God prosper the Commander of the Faithful, and may He help him guard the faith and may he preserve him to cherish the fortunes of the true believers. Surely his servant has obeyed his command and followed his injunction in studying the works of direction for the management of the state known as the secret of secrets, compiled by the excellent philosopher Aristotle, son of Nicomachus of Madha, for his pupil, the great king Alexander, son of Philip of Macedonia, known as Du al Carnain, when he was disabled by age and infirmity from accompanying the great conqueror during his wars. Alexander had appointed Aristotle as his prime minister and esteemed him as a particular friend, since Aristotle was possessed of sound judgment, desire for learning, and clear understanding, and in addition to special brilliant gifts, was versed in the practical and religious sciences. Further, he was pious, upright, humble, just, and truthful. For this reason, he is included by some learned men among the prophets. I have seen it written in several books of Grecian history that God made a revelation to him, saying, Verily, I prefer to call thee an angel rather than a man. Strange and marvelous things are related about him, which are too numerous to mention. There are different traditions about his death. It's contended by some that he died a natural death and is buried in his tomb, which is well known, while others affirm that he was lifted up to heaven in a column of light. By following his good advice and obeying his commands, Alexander achieved his famous conquests of cities and countries, and ruled supreme in the regions of the earth far and wide, Arabs as well as Persians coming under his sway. Nor did he ever oppose him in word or deed. On account of their great mutual friendship, many moral letters passed between them. One of them is Aristotle's reply to Alexander. The latter, after conquering Persia and subjugating the powerful ones of that country, had written to Aristotle, saying, O oh, my excellent preceptor and just minister, I'm to inform you that I have found in the land of Persia men possessing sound judgment and powerful understanding who are ambitious of bearing rule. Hence, I have decided to put them all to death. What is your opinion in this matter? Aristotle replied, If you are bent upon killing all of them, and are able to do so by reason of your own power over them, you cannot change their climate and their country. Therefore, conquer them by kindness and benevolence, and so obtain their love. Farewell. Alexander carried out these injunctions and made the Persians his most loyal subjects. Yuhana ibn al-Batrik, the translator, says, I visited every temple where philosophers have deposited their secrets and all the great recluses who, having a fine knowledge thereof, might fulfill my request until I arrived at the temple of the sun which had been built by the philosopher Asclepius. Here I met a devout and ascetic priest possessed of deep learning and unerring judgment, towards whom I used courtesy, humility, and strategy, till at last he let me see the writings deposited in that temple, and I found in those writings what I was seeking for. Then I returned with my prize to the august presence, and by the help of Almighty God, and the interest of the commander of the faithful, I set about translating it. I translated it 
from the Greek into Syriac, and then from Syriac into Arabic. The first thing that I had found therein was a manuscript of the philosopher Aristotle addressed to the Emperor Alexander, as follows. I have acquainted myself, O gifted son and just and exalted king. May God lead thee to the path of true guidance, and may he save thee from being misled by carnal desire. May he help thee with the reward of the next world, and of this one, with thy epistle, in which thou hast kindly spoken of thy regret at parting with me, and at my inability to accompany thee, and thou desirest that I should draw out for thee a code which should serve as a guide in all thy needs, and take my place with thee in all thine affairs. Thou knowest that my remaining behind thee has not been caused, because I no longer desire thy company, but that it has been caused owing to my advanced age and infirmity. As for the matter that thou hast asked for, it is so great that even the bosoms of the living cannot bear it, to speak nothing of lifeless paper. My obligations to thee make it incumbent on me to carry out thy request as far as it is right to do so, but at the same time I conjure thee not to compel me to reveal this secret more than what I am depositing in this book. If thou study it earnestly, I trust there will be no veil of obscurity between it and thee, for God has endowed thee with understanding and gifted thee with rare wisdom. Therefore, study its secrets according to my previous guidance and teaching, and thou shalt be rightly guided and achieve thy desire, if God will. I have darkly alluded to certain prohibited and profound mysteries, lest this book should fall into the hands of wicked and tyrannical men, who might discover what God did not deem them worthy to understand, and thus I should break the covenant which was laid upon me, and betray the secret entrusted to me by God. And I bind thee to guard these secrets, even as I have been bound. And he who betrays its secret shall not be safe from the evil consequences which shall soon overtake him. And may God preserve thee and us by his mercy. Now I mention to thee above all else that which I wish to make thy intimate friend, that is, a constant rule of life. That a king must have two helpers, particularly for himself. One of them is intellectual, namely the strength and composure of his own soul. For the soul is strengthened by the union and composure of its faculties, just as a king is strengthened by union of subjects and vice versa. Similarly, there should be a perfect harmony and cooperation between the potential and actual faculties of a ruler. This harmony and cooperation among the two kinds of faculties, or between the ruler and the ruled, are gained by two means. One of them is evident and apparent, and the other is secret and mysterious. With the former means I have already acquainted you. Namely, treat them with liberality and make them independent. This is connected with the subject of economy, which will be mentioned in its own place. The second of the two helps is the help given by the moral faculties to the actual ones. That is, it is a moral means of winning the hearts of subjects as the first one was a physical or material one. And this takes precedence of even the first. This too is gained by two means, one of which is apparent and the other secret. The first means of uniting the subject and creating harmony among the ruled ones is to treat them with justice and leniency. 
The secret means is one particular to the saints and sages whom God has chosen from amongst his creature and endorsed with his own knowledge. And I shall impart to thee this secret as well as others in certain chapters of this book, which is outwardly a treasure of wisdom and golden rules, and inwardly the cherished object itself. So when you have studied its contents and understood its secrets, you will thereby achieve your highest desires and fulfill your loftiest expectations. Rejoice in it, therefore, and may God help you attain this knowledge and to honor the master thereof. This, my book, contains ten discourses. Discourse 1. The Kinds of Kings. Discourse 2. On the Position and Character of a King and the Course He Should Pursue in Private Affairs and in All Administrative Work. Discourse 3. On the Form of Justice, Whereby a King is Made Perfect and Nobles and Commons are Governed. Discourse 4. On his ministers, their number, and the way of governing them. Discourse 5. On the king's scribes, their prerogatives, and ranks. Discourse 6. On his ambassadors, and their qualities, and the policy to be adopted in sending them. Discourse 7 on governors of his subjects, and those who are appointed to collect his revenues and other matters connected with his public offices. Discourse 8. On the government of his generals and the other officers of his army and lower ranks. Discourse 9. On the management of war, modes of strategy to be adopted in it, how to be safe from its results, how to meet the enemy and times chosen for doing so, when to set out, and the name of the general appointed for forces and for war. Discourse 10 On the Magical Sciences The Secrets of Astrology The Methods of Winning Over the People The Virtues of Minerals and Herbs, etc. Useful for the above mentioned purposes. Discourse 1 On the Kinds of Kings There are four kinds of kings. One, a king who is liberal to himself and liberal to his people. Two, a king who is liberal to himself but miserly to his people. 3. A king who is miserly to himself and miserly to his people. The Rumi says that there is no harm if a king is miserly to himself, but liberal to his people. And the Indians say that it is right for a king to be miserly to himself as well as to his people. The Persians contradict the Indians and say that a king ought to be liberal to himself as well as to his people. But all of them agree to this, that to be liberal to himself and miserly to his people is vicious for a king and corrupts his kingdom. In this discourse, it's necessary for us to explain liberality and avarice and to describe the evils of excess in liberality and those of deficiency in it. It has already been explained that all qualities and actions are vitiated as they approach their extremes, and that it is extremely hard to observe moderation in liberality, but that it is easy enough in the case of avarice. Moderation in liberality is to give what is needed when it is needed, and to help a deserving person to the extent of one's ability. But if one exceeds this, 
one becomes guilty of excess and falls into extravagance. And he who gives what is not needed is unworthy of praise. And he who gives untimely is like one who gives water to one who is himself standing on the bank of a river. And he who gives that which is not needed, or to one who does not deserve it, it is like one who helps his enemy against himself. But he who gives the right thing to the right person at the right time is liberal to himself as well as to his people. He is right in his acts and truly political. It is this one whom the ancients have named liberal and not he who gives great gifts and bestows rich presents to those who do not deserve them. For such a one is extravagant and spendthrift, for he squanders the wealth of his state. As for avarice, it is a name which is unworthy of kings and of a state, and when it happens to be the nature of a king, he should entrust the gifts of his state to a trustworthy person from among his close friends who would prevent him from being miserly. O Alexander, I say to thee that the king who exceeds the bounds of liberality and throws more burden on his state than it can bear, verily he will be the destruction of himself and of his state. As I say to thee, O Alexander, and I have never ceased from saying it to thee, that generosity and liberality and the permanence of a state depend upon withholding oneself from that which is in the hands of the people and abstaining from their possessions. And I have seen it written in some testaments of Hermes the Great that the perfect magnanimity of a king, the soundness of his judgment, and the permanence of his good name depend upon his abstaining from the possessions of the people. O oh, Alexander, the cause of the downfall of the kings of Hanaj was no other than this, that they extracted too much revenue from the people and seized their property. The people took refuge in the temple of lightning and asked the help of God. So he sent a devastating wind against the tyrants, which destroyed them, and parties rose up against them, and the kingdom became corrupt. And if God had not requited them as he did, their own acts would have brought about the corruption of their state and the downfall of their realm. For verily, Wealth is the means of the subsistence of animal life, and an essential part of it, and life cannot exist after the dissipation of that part. O oh, Alexander, an essential part of liberality and magnanimity is to give up seeking a pretext to injure another, and trying to find out the hidden faults of others, and to avoid mention of one's gifts. The perfection of all virtues is to turn away from perpetual fault-finding, to honor the generous, to meet men with a cheerful face, and to return their greetings, and to overlook the faults of the ignorant. O oh, Alexander, I have explained to thee what I have never ceased from explaining, and perhaps this will fix it in your mind, what I wish to tell thee to act upon, and which will lead thee to success. Now I tell thee a short maxim which alone should have sufficed to guide thee in all matters temporal and spiritual, even if I had not told thee the others. O oh, Alexander, reason is the head of policy and judgment. It is the health of the soul and the mirror of faults. By means of it, hateful objects are thrown down 
and lovable objects are exalted. It is the chief of all praiseworthy things and the fountainhead of all glories. O oh, Alexander, the first instrument of reason is the desire of a good name. And he who considers this as the true object of sovereignty is right and praiseworthy. But whoso loves sovereignty for the sake of power and self-indulgence is blameworthy and in error. To love sovereignty for its own sake leads to tyranny and injustice, which break the cord of attachment between the ruler and the ruled and destroy the allegiance of the people. The loss of allegiance causes enmity. Enmity leads to dissension, and dissension leads to hatred, and hatred to war. And war destroys law and civilization, and this leads to the opposition of nature, which destroys everything. But when the object of sovereignty is glory and good name, it leads to sincerity. Sincerity leads to piety, and sincerity inclines to all praiseworthy things. Sincerity is the opposite of falsehood. It creates amity and high-mindedness. High-mindedness creates courtesy, which leads to friendship, which leads to liberality and mutual exchange of gifts, which lead to the establishment of law and civilization, which are in accordance with nature. Hence it is evident that he who seeks sovereignty with his true aim leaves a permanent good name behind him. O Alexander, beware of encouraging thy lusts. They are destructive, for lusts lead to the ascendancy of the animal soul beyond what is necessary, so that the mortal body is tarnished and the immortal spirit is afflicted. The encouragement of lust causes voluptuousness, which leads to avarice, which leads to the love of riches. Love of riches leads to meanness, which leads to greed. Greed leads to perfidy, which leads to robbery, which leads to the loss of honor and manhood, which leads to strife, which destroys faith and love and ruins the world. And this is against nature. And God, may he be praised and exalted, knoweth best. Discourse 2 On the Quality of the King and the Nature and Conduct Proper to Him The first thing necessary for a king as regards his own person is that he should be known by a distinguished name and addressed as such, so as to be distinguished from all others. For he is an astounding figure which men point to and the goal they seek. O Alexander, the king who makes his state subservient to the law is worthy of his high position, and he who makes light of his high position is destroyed by it. O Alexander, I say what the philosophers and revered divines whom we follow the favor of God be upon them, have repeatedly said that the first quality needed in a king is wholly to observe divine commandments without disregarding or transgressing a single one of them, positive or negative. He must be a public example of the temperance and sincere faith, for if he practices hypocrisy, his guile will not succeed since the people are never blind to his conduct. 
he should never overlook shortcomings on the part of his subjects, even though that involves the loss of much money, for thus he will please God and make himself beloved of God's servants. Connected with this is his duty to respect those who represent religion, namely upright judges and reverend doctors and spiritual leaders. He should be aspiring, without arrogance, broad-minded, of keen discernment, foreseeing the issues of events. He ought to be merciful and kind. If he happens to fall into anger, he should take care not to act on the impulse of the moment without reflection. When passion stirs in him, he should suppress it by the power of reason and rule his own soul. And if his passion is righteous, he should act upon it without showing violence or contempt. Further, he should adorn himself with comely ornament and peculiar dress, which shall attract the eyes and delight the soul and distinguish him from other men. He ought also to have a melodious, eloquent, and loud voice. Loudness of voice is advantageous for a king when the occasion comes for rebuke, but he should spare loud words, except in rare circumstances, lest he be heard too often, and the people, becoming familiar with his talk, despise his authority. It's best that he should speak to no one except in reply. He should rarely converse with his subjects or associate with them, especially with the common people. How praiseworthy is the method of the Indians, who say in the admonitions to their kings, the appearance of a king before the common people is detrimental to him and weakens his power. Therefore, a king should show himself to them only from afar and always when surrounded by a retinue of guards. Once a year, when the season of assembly comes, he appears before all his people. One of his eloquent ministers stands up before him and delivers a speech in which he praises God and thanks him for their allegiance to their sovereign. Then he says how well and pleasing they are and how much care is taken on their behalf, and exhorts them to be obedient, and warns them against disobedience. Then he reads their petitions, hears their complaints, dispenses justice, and grants gifts to them. He pardons their sins, and makes them feel how near he is to the highest and the lowest among them. As he comes out among his people only once a year and does not obtrude upon them, they remember that as a great event which gave them joy and pleasure. They relate it to their relatives and children, so that their little ones grow up to obey and love him. Thus he is well spoken of in private and in public, and thus he becomes safe from the rising of parties against him and from the intrigues of the seditious. The ambitious will not seek to subvert his authority for that reason. Also, it is necessary that he should lower all the taxes, especially in the case of those who come into his presence as merchants and traders, because by abstaining from their properties and treating them with justice, they will return more frequently and their number will increase and his country will be greatly benefited by the variety of goods and men and beasts. And this is the means of civilization of the country, increase of its revenue, flourishing of its condition, and humiliation of its enemies. Therefore, he who abstains from little gains much. and do not incline to that which does no good and is soon lost, but seek the wealth which is never exhausted, 
the life which never changes, the sovereignty which never ceases, and the permanency which never perishes. Seek a fair name, which is the greatest treasure. Never adopt the habit of the brutes and the wild beasts which steal everything they find and search for what they have not lost, have little regard for what they have obtained, and follow their lust in eating, drinking, mating, and sleeping. O oh, Alexander, lean not towards lechery, for it is a habit of swine. And what glory is there in a thing in which the brutes excel thee? It emaciates the body, destroys life, corrupts the constitution, causes effeminacy. We have likened it to the habit of swine, and that is enough. A king should participate in amusement with his family, for they warm the soul and please the senses and exhilarate the body. When he indulges in them, it should be for three or four days, or as long as he thinks proper. The courtiers should not know of this, but should be given to understand that he is privately engaged in important business affecting them. He should also have trusty emissaries to keep him well informed of important events. A king should not wholly avoid eating or amusing himself with his favorite courtiers and notables, but it must not be done more often than twice or thrice in a year. He ought to honor those who deserve honor and assign them to their proper rank. In order to show his love for them, he should praise them to their faces and give them cups of wine and present them with robes of honor as far as he is able. And if the present of a robe makes a man faithful to his king, the king may then bestow on him a finer gift and show him a greater affection. He should treat the others in the same way till he has dealt with them all. It is also necessary for a king always to have much gravity and to laugh little, for excessive laughing destroys dignity and hastens on old age. All those who present themselves in the king's assembly ought to observe due respect and to show befitting reverence. If any one happens to commit an act of disrespect, he should be duly punished. If he is of high rank, his punishment should be banishment from the assembly till he learns better manners. But if anyone is guilty of an offense willfully done in contempt of the royal presence, his punishment should be death. O oh, Alexander, in the books of the kings of India, it is said that the cause of a monarch ruling his subject, or being ruled by them, is merely a strong or weak mind. Asclepius says of the rulers, The best ruler is he who resembles a vulture surrounded by carcasses, not he who resembles a carcass surrounded by vultures. O oh, Alexander, loyalty to the king springs from four qualities. Religious feeling, love, desire, and fear. Remove the complaints of the people and relieve them of injustice and oppression. And do not give them an opportunity of seeking complaint, because when they are enabled to speak, they can also act. Therefore, strive to stop their tongues, and thou shalt be safe from their actions. Know that fear of the king is the peace of the realm. And it is said, in the books of the Indians, let thy fear in their souls be worse than thy sword in their hearts. Verily, the king resembles the rain which is a draught from God and a divine blessing, reviving the earth and those who are on it. It may bring inconvenience to travelers, demolish houses, 
cause lightning and floods which destroy men and animals, and make the sea to rage and bring about severe calamity. But this does not prevent mankind, when they consider the effects of the grace of God, whereby vegetation is revived, and sustenance comes forth, and mercy is shed abroad, from appreciating the favor of God, and thanking him for it. And the king also resembles the winds which God sends as harbingers of his blessing. He drives the clouds by means of them, and causes them to fertilize the fruits and impart new life to mankind. By means of them, he makes their rivers to flow, lights their fires, and drives their ships. They injure many things on land and sea, both the lives and property of mankind, and cause plagues and simoons. Men may complain of them to God, but he does not make them cease from the function he has assigned to them. The same is the case with the summer and the winter, the heat and the cold, of which God created for the sake of fructification and procreation, although harm may be done by the heat and cold of these seasons with their simoons and chills. A king is in the same position. O oh, Alexander, inquire into the condition of the weak in thy kingdom far and near. Help them from thy treasury in time of famine. Bestow this office on a trustworthy man who is well acquainted with their misfortune, and who is anxious to help them as thou art thyself. Because verily, to remove their wants is to help preserve the law, to comfort the hearts of the common people, and to please the Creator. O Alexander, be careful of thine affairs, so that thine actions may be right. It is good policy to remove the fear of thy punishment from the hearts of pious and peaceful people, and to inspire the minds of suspicious characters and mischievous people with the fear of thy chastisement, so much that they imagine in their seclusion that thine eyes are upon their actions. O oh, Alexander! Garner up as much store of corn as possible as a precaution against years of famine. And when there is scarcity, take out all that thou hast garnered and other people of thy empire have garnered. This will put down every corruption and disturbance and will help to give permanency to law. O oh, Alexander! The most emphatic command I give thee, and have always given, by obeying which thy rule will be strong and thy sovereignty lasting, is to refrain from shedding blood without cause, and from exacting the extreme penalty of law, for God has particularly warned his creatures against it. Thou mayest act merely on appearance, and not know the hidden truth. Therefore, Try to avoid as much as possible, and save thyself from error and its vengeful consequences. Verily, Hermes the Great is right in saying, When one creature wrongfully kills another, the angels complain to their maker and cry out, This thy servant has tried to make himself like unto thee. Then, if he has killed them in punishment of an act of murder, God replies to them, He had killed, therefore he has been killed. But if he has been killed for the sake of a worldly good, or on a false suspicion, God replies to his angels, By my glory and power I make forfeit the blood of this my slave and the angels continue to curse the slayer in all their prayers and invocations, so that his life may be forfeited. And if the culprit happens to die a natural death according as is destined, and is not slain, then he draws on himself the wrath of God all the more, 
and is consigned to perpetual punishment and pain unless he dies repentant. O oh, Alexander, in all cases where punishment is necessary, you will find that a long imprisonment or severe chastisement is sufficient, and this I need not explain in detail. But in exacting penalties, follow the writings of thy divine ancestors, and thine actions will always be right. O oh, Alexander, consider thy weakest enemy as if he were the strongest. Do not despise him, because many a weak and contemptible enemy becomes a powerful one, whose treatment is difficult and whose disease is baffling. O Alexander, beware of perfidy, for it is the nature of foolish children. Its consequence is evil, and although it may achieve some little, it depriveth of much. Thus, beware of breaking thy promises and violating thy covenants. For that is an extreme form of treachery, a failure of manliness, and a destroyer of much worldly success, which I have previously warned thee to avoid. O Alexander, thou knowest that on thy right hand and on thy left are two spirits who reckon against thee thy smallest and greatest words and actions, whereof they inform thy Maker who knoweth best. Therefore, guide thy conduct in the knowledge that all thy secret and public deeds are laid before thy Maker. O oh, Alexander, what can compel a king to take an oath? There is no hand over a king's hand except that of God's. Therefore, never make use of an oath unless even to be cut with a knife would not make you break it. For verily Enoch, Safur, and Hananij lost their kingdoms simply through breaking their oaths, for the sake of worldly goods, and their government perished through their excessive use of force. The breaking of agreements in state policy is required in certain situations, as I have before mentioned. This is not the place to explain these, but further on in this book I will refer to them briefly. Ponder them, and thou shalt be successful if God will. O Alexander, never grieve for what is past, for it is the quality of women and weak persons. Show politeness and manliness, because it will increase thy wealth and humiliate thy enemies. And order the people of thy country to read and study the arts and sciences, and treat generously those who distinguish themselves in learning and science. Read the petitions of thy people carefully, and reward their good deeds. This will increase the love of the people to thee, and perpetuate thy name in history. O Alexander, the Greeks did not acquire greatness and fame except by their love of knowledge and their exertion to acquire it so much so that their maidens in their homes of their fathers were learned in the rules of their religion and their laws. They were acquainted with the situations of the seven planets, the bows of day and night, with the strings of the bows and their quivers, with the courses of the moon. They knew how to make predictions by stars, what hours to choose for various purposes, and other sciences, such as medicine. O oh, Alexander, do not put thy trust in the service of women, except the woman who values her loyalty above her life and thy life and thy possessions. For thou art no more than a mere trust in their hands if thy life is at their mercy. Beware of poisons for many kings have lost their lives by them, and in taking medicine 
do not trust to one physician, for a single man is liable to be seduced. If possible, have ten physicians, and take the medicine regarding the use of which they all agree. Thy medicines should be prepared in the presence of all the physicians, as well as one of thy own trusty servants, who understands medicines and knows the method of compounding and weighing them. Remember the mother of the Indian king who sent to thee some presents, one of which was a girl who had been brought up on poison until her nature had become that of poisonous serpents. And if I had not found it out through my knowledge of the Indian kings and physicians, and had not suspected her to be capable of inflicting a fatal bite, surely she would have killed thee. O oh, Alexander, guard thy noble immortal soul, for verily it is a trust with thee. And do not be like the ignorant people of the temples who follow the letter without understanding its meaning. And if it may be possible for thee, do not rise, nor sit, nor eat, nor drink, nor do anything, except at a time chosen by astrology. For thus you will prosper. Because verily, God has not created anything uselessly. And it was through that that the learned Plato came to know the situations of the parts of compounds with the difference of their colors, that is, qualities, at their conception according to their composing relations. Hence he discovered the art of painting on silk and drawing pictures. And do not listen to those fools who say that the science of astrology is false and useless, and that one who predicts future events by means of astrology is an impostor. And I say that it is necessary to pay due regard to astrology, for although man cannot avoid his fate, yet by knowing it beforehand, he prepares himself for it, and makes use of the remedies calculated to avert it. As people provide themselves with shelter, fuel, furs, etc., to defend themselves against the rigors of coming winter, similarly to meet the hot weather they provide themselves with cooling things, and against the years of famine they collect provisions and store them up, likewise for fear of strife they emigrate to another country. There is another advantage, and that is that when men know of events before they happen, they can ask God to avert them, and before the crisis they may pray to God and humble themselves before him, and ask for forgiveness and pardon, and repent and fast and pray and beseech Almighty God to spare them. And the science of the stars is divided into three parts the composition of the spheres, and the direction of the planets, and the distribution of the stars, and their distance and their motions, and this science is called astronomy. There is another part of it, namely the knowledge of how the circling of the spheres and the rising of the constellations indicate events before they happen under the sphere of the moon, and this science is called the science of decrees. The root of the science of the stars is the knowledge of three things. Planets, heavenly spheres, and the signs of the zodiac. As for the stars, Kalkab, known by means of observation, they are one thousand and twenty-nine in number. I am writing for thee a secret of the science of therapeutics, which will make thee independent of physicians in the matter of preserving thy health. For the methods of preserving health and soundness of body are the most useful things to be explained and acted upon in the interest of matters temporal as well as spiritual. No object of this world or of the next can be obtained without strength, and strength depends upon health. Health 
depends upon the temperance of the four humors, and God has created means of adjusting them, and he has instructed in them his people through his chosen prophets and friends. And the sages of India, Rome, Persia, and Greece have discovered in this subject things which no wise man ought to ignore, because the man who disregards the well-being of himself would do so even more with regard to others, and it is not difficult for sound minds with right judgments to understand those methods by which health is gained and preserved. The most reliable school among those mentioned is the Greek school, and whatever I shall write in this book will be according to the theories and beliefs of the Greeks. O Alexander Learned men and philosophers agree in this that man is composed of contrary humors and needs food and drink. If he is deprived of them, his life is destroyed. And if he commits excess in them, or eats and drinks too little, he is afflicted with diseases and weakness. But if he is temperate, he is benefited, and his body and strength are improved. And all those wise men agree in their opinions that whoever exceeds the bounds of moderation in filling his stomach, or in leaving it empty, or in sleeping, or wakefulness, or in motion or rest, or in purgation, or in letting blood, or in excessive cohabitation, is not safe from the onrush of diseases and sudden illness, which I shall describe later. Now, I'm going to mention some advantages of moderation and evils of indulgence and excess. It is agreed that whoso guards against excess and observes moderation and temperance obtains health and long life. I do not find any one of the ancients disagreeing with this, that all the affairs of this world, power, wealth, pleasure, and the sensual gratification, depend upon existence. Therefore, whoso loves existence ought to observe all that is useful and agreeable to it, and shun sensual things, not preferring one meal to many meals. Verily, I have heard it related of the famous Socrates that he used to impose great abstemiousness upon himself. A disciple of his said to him, O sage, if thou wilt increase a little thy food, it will increase thy strength and vivacity. He replied, O oh, my son, verily I eat in order to live, and do not live in order to eat. And I have seen those who are abstemious and temperate who restrict themselves to vegetable food and practice physical exercise are healthier in body, keener in appetite, and lighter in motion than those who indulge themselves. Evidence of this is found in the case of people who subject to labor and fatigue. Bedouin and ascetics, and it is a true maxim that the best medicine is moderation in all things. O oh, Alexander, know that the preservation of health is obtained, by the will of God, by two means. Firstly, eating and drinking that which agrees with the individual, the time of the year, the individual's habits, and the customary nourishment by which his body is sustained. Secondly, purging himself of the superfluity which is engendered by destructive and corrupting humors. As the human body and whatever is taken into it of food and drink are gradually dissolved and softened by natural heat, which dries up all the moisture of animal bodies, as well as the rivers and seas, Therefore, if the body is soft and warm, hard foods benefit it most, because the solvent power of that body is great, by reason of the openness of its pores and the strength of its heat. But if the body is hard and turbid and dry, 
then food that is moist and mild is the most beneficial, because the solvent power of that body is weak by reason of the narrowness of its pores. In order to be healthy, a man must take what agrees with his normal temperament. If his temperament is warm, moderately warm food will agree with him, and if his temperament is cold, then moderately cold things will be found to agree more with him, and similarly with moist and dry temperaments. And if heat and inflammation grow excessive in the body, either through eating food of an excessively heating nature, or through the predominance of passion, then cold things of a contrary nature will be beneficial. And when the stomach is warm, strong, and healthy, the best food for the owner thereof is coarse and strong food, for his stomach is like a strong fire which can consume great logs of wood. But if the stomach is cold and weak, the most beneficial food for it is that which is light and easily digestible. For such a stomach is like a small weak fire which must be fed at first with reeds and thin sticks. Symptoms of good health are lightness of the body, cleanliness of the bowels, and keenness of the appetite. Signs of bad health are limpness of the body, laziness, puffiness of the face, excessive saliva, heaviness of the eyes, sluggishness of the bowels, sourness, acidity, bitterness, wateriness, bad odor, rumbling, and wind in the stomach, and loss of appetite. When the disease causing the above symptoms increases and takes strength, it brings on piles, yawning, shivering, etc., all of which corrupt the body and destroy the constitution. Therefore, one ought to take precautions against them. The Superior Degree of Counsel It is necessary for thee, O Alexander, that when thou risest from thy sleep, thou shouldst take a short walk and stretch thy limbs moderately and comb thy hair. For verily, the stretching of limbs hardens the body, and walking drives out the vapors which rise to the head during sleep. Then bathe yourself in summer with cold water as it strengthens the body and keeps the natural heat, and thus helps to increase appetite. Then put on a clean garment and clothe thyself in goodly apparel, for the sense of sight rejoices to look thereat, and the spirit is strengthened by delighting therein. Then, brush thy teeth with a tooth-stick made of bitter astringent and acid wood, and not of an unknown wood. For verily, there are numerous advantages in brushing the teeth. It cleanses the teeth and the mouth and melts away the phlegm, frees the tongue and polishes it, creates an appetite for food even. Then, take the medicinal snuff according to the seasons of the year for there are great advantages in taking it. It opens the pores of the brain, thickens the neck and the upper arm, beautifies the complexion, strengthens the senses, and prevents the premature grayness of hair. Then perfume thyself befitting the season, for verily the soul is nourished by smelling sweet scents and pleasant smells, and when the soul is nourished and strengthened, the body is also strengthened, and the heart is cheered thereby, and the blood courses through the veins owing to the cheerfulness of the heart. Then put in thy mouth a seed of clove, a piece of fresh aloe wood, or a piece of nutmeg, because it drives out phlegm from the mouth and removes disease of the whole throat and mouth. Then give an audience to the great men, Converse with them, and exchange courtesies, and transact necessary business, either spiritual, temporal, or any other, according to thy wish, and let them not find in thy mouth any evil sayings. And when thou feelest the desire of food at its accustomed time, first thou shalt perform some physical exercise, as wrestling, hard walking, riding, 
weightlifting or the like. For the advantage of this is to break up the wind, strengthen and lighten the body, kindle up the heat of the stomach, and rouse the soul. Then let there be placed before thee various kinds of eatables, and eat the kind on which thy choice falls, and to which thy appetite is excited. Then, if possible, do not exceed the bounds, and do not eat to repletion. That is the desire and aim. But if it is not possible for thee, then observe moderation, and eat at first what should be eaten at first, and last what ought to be eaten last. As, for instance, when one wishes to take a soft and binding diet, at one and the same meal, he should take the soft first and the binding one afterwards, in order to make a free passage for the food after its digestion. But if the binding food is taken first and the soft one afterwards, there is no free passage for both foods become corrupted. Similarly, if he takes at one time the same meal food which is quickly digestible, and food which is slow of digestion, he should take the food which is slow of digestion into the bottom of his stomach, because the bottom of the stomach is warmer and stronger in digesting on account of it being formed of a stronger and warmer substance, and being situated closer to the liver, which is a cooking agent. The upper part of the stomach is sinewy, cold and weak in digesting, so that when food rises to the top of the stomach, it is not speedily digested. Another point in eating is to withhold thy hand when there is still some of thy appetite left, because eating to satiety straightens the soul and causes the food to remain lying in the bottom of the stomach. He should also restrain himself from drinking immediately after food habitually, because water taken soon after eating cools the stomach extinguishes the heat of the appetite, and corrupts the food, and brings on indigestion, which is the worst of bodily afflictions, and is named deferred poison. But if it is found necessary to drink water, either on account of the hot weather, or the heat of the stomach, or of the food, then drink a little very cold water. Then, at the end of eating, drink a little wine mixed with about ten istars of water. When he has finished eating, he should walk a little on soft carpets, then lie down on his left side and finish his sleep, because the left side is cold and needs something to warm it. And if one feels heaviness in his lower ribs, he should wrap up his stomach with some heavy and warm cloth, or take in his arms a girl of warm body and if he feels sour belching, which is a sign of a cold stomach, he should drink hot water with oxymel. Then he should vomit, because it is very injurious to the body to keep back the corrupt food in the stomach. And movement before food kindles up the fire of the stomach, but the same after food is bad, because it carries down the food before it is fully digested, and thus leads to stoppages and diseases. Sleep before food emaciates the body and dries up its moisture, but sleep after food is nourishing and strengthening. Because in sleep, the outer part of the body becomes cool, and the natural heat which is diffused through the body is collected in the stomach and around it, which helps the stomach to digest the food. And the external part of the body, is left free from its natural function, and the vital energy takes rest. Thus the wise esteem the evening meal more than the midday meal, for the midday meal has to cope with the heat of the day and the preoccupation of the sense and soul with what the individual listens to or engages in or thinks about, and with the fatigue and movement around him so that the natural heat is diffused over the exterior of the body, and the stomach is thereby hindered from digesting the food. But the opposite of this is the case at the evening meal, for it is accompanied by rest of the body and stillness of the senses and soul, and the coolness of the evening, which drives the natural heat 
into the interior of the body. Beware taking nourishment a second time before thou hast become certain that the first meal is fully digested. Thou wilt know this by a feeling of appetite and the collecting of saliva in the mouth, because whenever one eats food before the body requires it, the food meets with the natural heat in the state of the latter's quiescence, as fire is quiescent under ashes. But when a man takes food in a state of true appetite and need for it, it meets with a strong natural heat, like a fire which is kindled up. And as soon as thou feelest hunger, thou shouldst hasten to take thy meal, for if thou delayest, the stomach will consume the superfluous matter of the body, will collect foul humors, and cause noxious vapors to rise to the brain. And if food is taken after that, it gets spoiled and does not do any good to the body. And if any one who is in the habit of eating twice a day changes that habit and begins to eat once only, it does him great harm. Just as if one who is in the habit of eating once a day begins to eat twice, his food does not agree with him. Likewise, if one changes the usual time of his meals, he soon finds the evil of doing so. Habit is second nature. Therefore, if through some cause it is found necessary to change a habit, it is imperative that it should be changed little by little, one degree at a time. And it is also necessary for us to mention in this chapter the four seasons and the changes of weather. The first of the four is the spring season. When the sun enters the first degree of Aries, it is the beginning of the spring season. Its duration, according to the opinion of authorities on the subject, is 93 days, 23 hours, and one quarter of an hour. It begins on the 21st of Azar, March, and ends on the 23rd of Haziran, June. The beginning of the spring is called the vernal equinox because the days and nights become equal in all climes. Weather becomes temperate, and the air balmy. Breezes blow, snows are melted, streams flow, rivers become full, wells gush forth. Moisture rises to the branches of the trees, and vegetation grows up. Corn, grasses, and herbs grow up. Trees bear leaves and blossoms. Flower buds open up and the earth becomes green. Living things come into being. Beasts of the field multiply. Udders flow with milk. Animals disperse over the country from their nests. The life of the dwellers in the deserts becomes pleasant. The earth is bedecked and ornamented, and the flowers become like a young girl adorned and resplendent before onlookers. This season is warm, moist, and temperate, and resembles in its nature air and stirs the blood. In this season it is useful to take moderate food as chickens, partridges, and pheasants, half-cooked eggs, lettuce, endive, and goat's milk. No other time than this is it better for bleeding and cupping. And it is allowable to commit excess in this season in cohabitation, use of purgatives and baths, and bringing on perspiration. Any error in medical treatment, purging or bleeding, which may take place at this time of the season, safeguards it and sets it right, if God Almighty pleases. The Summer Season When the sun enters the first degree of cancer, it is the beginning of the summer season. It lasts for ninety-two days and twenty-three and one-third hours. It begins on the 23rd of June, Hazaran, and ends on the 24th of September, Ailu, 
and this time the length of the day and the shortness of the night reach the limit in all climes. Thenceforth, the day begins to grow shorter and the night longer. Heat becomes equal, the air becomes warm, hot winds blow, water decreases, vegetation dries up, and the strength of bodies increases, and the earth becomes like a bride, laden with riches and having many lovers. This season is hot and dry, and spleen predominates in it. Therefore, one ought to avoid all hot things, whether food, drink, or medicine, and one ought to beware of overeating, that the heat of the stomach may not be quenched. One should eat all kinds of cold food, such as veal cooked with vinegar, gourds, fat chickens and fine flour, and of fruits, sour apples, plums, and sour pomegranates, and the scents and oils used of a cold nature. Iced water should be drunk. Extreme moderation should be observed in cohabitation. Bleeding and cupping should be avoided. But the bath may be used. It is good to vomit in this season as the superfluous matter of the body increases in summer and rises to the top of the stomach. Purgatives and gargling should be avoided except when quite necessary. The Autumn Season When the sun passes into the first degree of Libra, it is the beginning of autumn. It lasts for 88 days and 17 and one-twelfth hours, beginning on the 24th of September, Elul, and the 22nd of December, Kanun. At this time, the nights and days become equal for the second time, and thenceforth the night begins to grow longer than the day. Summer is at an end and autumn has come. The air is cold, north winds blow, the season changes. Waters lessen, rivers dry up, and springs subside. Vegetation is dried up. Fruits are exhausted. Men garner grain and fruit, and the earth loses its beauty. The insects die out. Reptiles retire into their holes. Birds and wild beasts disappear in their quest of a warmer climate. Provisions are collected against winter. The weather changes, and the earth becomes like a mature matron who has passed the years of her youth. This season is cold and dry, and suits such foods and drinks as are warm, soft, and moist, as chickens, mutton, sweet grapes, and well-matured wine. Such things as produce black bile should be avoided. Motion and cohabitation and gargling may be indulged in this season more freely than in the summer, but less than in the winter and spring. The frequent use of the bath is recommended. If one feels the necessity of vomiting, one should do so either in the middle of the day or at the end, as superfluous matters of the body collect at these times. As purgatives, he should take garicon, garlic, and aftimum, a daughter of thyme, and anything that drives out choler and softens the humors by the help of Almighty God. The Winter Season When the sun enters the first degree of Capricorn, it is the beginning of winter. It lasts for 89 days and 14 and one twelfth hours, from the 22nd of December, Kanun, to the 21st of March, Azar. At this time, the length of the night and the shortness of the day reach to their extremes once again and the day begins to grow longer than the night. Autumn is finished, winter has arrived. Cold is intense, bitter winds blow, the leaves of the trees fall, 
Most of the vegetation dies, and most of the animals take refuge in the belly of the earth, and in mountain caves from the severe cold of the frequent storms and rain. The heavens grow dark, and the face of the earth frowns. The animals grow thin, bodies grow weaker, and the world becomes like a decrepit old woman to whom death draws near. This season is cold and moist, and phlegm predominates in it. Therefore, in the matter of nourishment and medicine, it is necessary to seek after warm things, such as young pigeons, flesh of a young goat not more than one year old, roast meat, hot spices, figs, walnuts, garlic, thick red wine, hot electuaries and sweetened compounds. Hot clusters may be used. Purgatives, bleeding, and cupping should be avoided except in case of necessity. Then, the air should be changed and heated, and first of all hot drinks should be taken, and the body rubbed with warm oils, and one should enter a temperate bath. In this season, even excess in exertion, cohabitation, and eating does not do much harm, because the natural heat withdraws itself into the lower part of the body and the digestive power increases. Stomachs remain cold in spring and summer because then, the natural heat being feeble, the digestive power decreases in those seasons, and the humors are active. The following is the chapter of the parts of the body. Know that the body has four parts. First, the head. When superfluous humors collect in it, the symptoms of this are darkness in the eyes, heaviness of the eyelids, throbbing of the temples, sounds in the ears, and stuffiness in the nostrils. Therefore, whosoever feels those symptoms should take some absinthe wormwood and boil it in the sweet wine with the roots of sa'atar, marjoram, until half of the water is evaporated. Then, he should rinse his mouth with it every morning until relief comes. He should also eat with his food two drams of prepared mustard and some kind of aperient which contains twelve ukar medicinal plants, when he goes to sleep, because if he disregards those symptoms, he may be attacked by deadly diseases like the corruption of sight, swelling, pains in the throat, and headaches. Second, the chest. When superfluous humors are collected in the chest, the signs of this are heaviness of the tongue, acidity of the mouth, sourness of food on top of the stomach, pains in the temples, and coughing. So one must lessen one's food and vomit. After vomiting, one should take bitter water of roses with aloes and mastic. After food, one should take a walnut-sized piece of electuary, alanizum al kabi that is aniseed, made with aloes and galangale. Whoever disregards this will suffer pleurisy, pains in the kidneys, and fever. Third, the stomach. When superfluous humors are gathered in the stomach, the signs of this are windiness, pains in the knee joints, shivering, feverishness, and winds. Therefore, whoso feels these symptoms should use a purgative of some soft apparent medicine and should follow the treatment we have prescribed for the chest, because if one disregards them one may be afflicted with pain in the hips and the back and joints, disordered stomach, bad digestion, and stoppage of the liver. Fourth, the bladder. When the superfluous humors are collected in it, the signs are loss of appetite, eruptions and pimples on the testes and privy parts, 
Therefore, who suffers this ought to take celery and fennel and their roots, and soak them in white sweet-smelling wine, and should partake of it every morning with water and honey before breaking his fast. He should abstain from overeating, for whosoever disregards these symptoms will be afflicted with the pain of the bladder and liver, and stopping of the urine and the anus. It is written in an ancient book that a certain king called together the physicians of Rum, India, and Persia, and ordered them to name some medicine whose habitual use would be beneficial and curative for all sorts of complaints. What the Rumi chose and advised was the drinking of draughts of hot water every morning. The Persian sage advised al harfa, that is, cress, and the Indian advises Indian mirobalan. And I say to thee, O Alexander, whoever finds himself at night without a weight of food on the stomach need not fear apoplexy and pain in the joints. And whoever eats every morning seven mitkals of sweet currants need not fear any of the phlegmatic diseases. His memory will be strengthened, and his intellect sharpened. And he who eats in winter some sweet asafetida, free from bad smell, he shall be safe from intermittent fever and winds in the side. And whosoever eats two walnuts with three seeds or grains of figs and some leaves of the herb rue, he shall be safe for that day from poison. O Alexander, preserve and take care of thy natural heat, because as long as there is temperate heat and moderate moisture in man, the heat feeds upon the moisture, and verily that heat is the principle of life and health. Man becomes old, and his body grows weak from two causes. Firstly, from natural decay, which is unavoidable, and is brought on by the predominance of dryness in the body and corruption of the being. And secondly, accidental decay, which is brought on by accidents, diseases, or evil treatment. Diet Know that foods are of three kinds, light, heavy, and moderate. Light foods create pure, healthy blood. Such foods are flour, fat chickens, and eggs. Heavy food is useful for people of hot temperaments and those who have to perform hard labor before and after food. Moderate food does not create obstructions or dangerous superfluous humors or chime. Such foods are fine wheaten bread, kids, sheep one year old, and in short, all meats that are hot and moist. But they differ from each other according to the manner of their cooking. Roasted meat derives strength, heat, and dryness from the fire unless it is treated with something which will break up its heat, as vinegar, lemon, tamarind, and cherries. Similarly, fried meats must be treated with spices. Therefore, follow this analogy and oppose hot with cold and vice versa in seasoning food, except in the case when you desire hot food to counteract a cold temperament or to excite carnal appetite. Some flesh soon changes into black bile, as the flesh of the cow, the camel, the mountain goat, the kata, and the fat goat, because they are heavy or coarse and dry by nature. But the flesh of young castrated animals which feed on moist green pasture and frequent the shade is most tender and beneficial. The same may be said about fish. Those which have a small body and thin skin, which feed sparingly and live in sweet flowing waters, are lighter and better than those which live in the salt seas and in lakes. Large fish with large body and much fat ought to be avoided, as poison is to be expected therefrom. And I have prepared a book on the subject of diet and medicine for the use of the great and the common alike, and it may be consulted for further information. Waters. 
Water is necessary for every living being and vegetable. And I have already informed thee that all waters, sweet and bitter, from the sea or lakes, differ according to district and the nature of the earth and the rising of the sun and the moon, and I have explained the cause thereof more than once. The best and the lightest water is that which is distant from buildings and is obtained from springs. When the land is flat and bare and contains little putridity, its water is good and light. But the water found in wooded and tainted country is heavy and injurious. One should avoid water in which is green slime or worms. The best water is that which is light, colorless, pure, and of good odor, which soon becomes hot or cold, and which pleases nature, and that which flows from west to east. Salty, turbid, and noxious waters dry up the stomach and sometimes bring diarrhea. The water of melted snow and ice is also bad and heavy. Similarly, water situated in barren lands and marshes is noxious and heavy because it remains stationary and the sun always shines on it. Such waters create bilious humors and enlarge in the spleen and liver. Similarly, with water which springs from hot and noisome lands, because it contains particles of those lands. Drinking cold water before food emaciates the body and quenches the fire of the stomach. Drinking it after food heats the body and increases phlegm, and if taken in excess, it corrupts the food. Cold water should be drunk in summer and hot water in winter for hot water in summer destroys the stomach, just as cold water in winter extinguishes the heat and corrupts the organs of the chest and liver. Tepid water, drunk in winter, extinguishes the heat and corrupts the organs of the chest and liver, and often kills suddenly, the reason whereof would take long to explain. Wine made from mountain grapes is drier than that of grapes growing on level and well-watered lands. The former is useful for aged people and those possessing moist and phlegmatic temperaments, and is hurtful to young people and those having warm temperaments and thin people. Wine made from grapes growing on well-watered plains is good for young people and those having hot temperaments. Wine as it grows older, increases in heat and softness, and is useful for removing cold and thick humors, and the more it increases in redness of color and in thickness, the more it acquires blood-creating powers. And the more bitter, strong, and sour it is, the less blood-creating and nutritive qualities it possesses, and it resembles medicine more than food. And habitual use of wine is highly injurious to every sort of men. And sweet wine corrupts and destroys the stomach, and produces rumbling and winds and obstacles. The best and the most wholesome wine for all temperaments is that which comes from lands midday between mountain and plain, between the moist and the dry, whose grapes are sweet and well ripened and not so much pressed as to give out the juice of the skin and stones, and the acidity of the tendrils. Wine which is of a good color, between red and yellow, the dregs of which are settled down, and the particles clear. Such wine as possesses these qualities, do thou partake of moderately, according to the time of the year, and the constitution, for it washes the mouth of the stomach and strengthens natural heat, helps digestion, prevents the food from getting corrupted, and brings it into motion, cooks it and conveys its purity to the various organs, and cooks it in them until it becomes essential blood. Then, from it, there rise to the brain temperate and moist vapors, so that harmful diseases are removed from the brain, and together with all this it cheers the heart, 
beautifies the complexion, frees the tongue, emboldens the timid, impels to all which is robust and joyful, and inspires to every noble virtue and praiseworthy quality. But excess of it, and lack of moderation in habitual drinking, to such an extent as to subvert reason and take away sensation, destroys the brain, weakens the vital energy, corrupts the intelligence, causes lapse of memory, and weakens the five senses, which are the main support for the body. It destroys the appetite for food, weakens the sinews which support the body, and produces tremors, weakness of sight, and paralysis. It excites the heat of the liver and thickens its blood, and blackens the blood of the heart, from which arise melancholy, quivering, fear, and imbecility. It spoils the complexion, weakens the bladder, and relaxes the muscles surrounding it and the muscles of the stomach. It corrupts the temperament, makes coarse the epidermis, and brings on elephantiasis. It is a kind of poison, therefore never take it to excess. It's like rhubarb, which is the life of the liver and possesses many virtues as is mentioned in the registers, and yet is the most deadly poison for one who does not know the right quantity to be used. Just as serpent's venom is the supreme antidote to snake bites, so in wine there is a cure for many severe pains and troublesome ailments. And never incline to drink sweetened vinegar on an empty stomach, especially when thou feelest a preponderance of moisture and phlegm in thyself. To Homer is attributed a wonderful saying concerning the drinking of wine. He says that it's strange that a man who drinks grape wine and eats wheat bread and mutton and never commits excess in eating, drinking, cohabitation, and physical exertion should ever fall ill or die or become old. And for one who happens to have indulged excessively in drinking, it is advisable to bathe with warm water. Then he should go into a running stream and sit down under an awning of a willow and myrtle on the bank of the stream or clear lake. Then he should sprinkle rose water on that awning and rub on his body pounded sandalwood. Then he should be fanned with fans made of cooling branches. This will cure him of the effects of excessive drinking. Likewise, he who intends to give up drinking wine should not discontinue it quite suddenly, but should lessen it gradually and change it from current wine, always mixing it with an increasing quantity of water, until his drink becomes pure water. And in this he ought to persevere. By such treatment, the constitution will be safe from dreaded ailments by the power of Almighty God. O oh, Alexander, of the things I have mentioned there are some which strengthen the body and others which weaken it, some fatten it and others make it thin, some moisten it and others dry it, some invigorate and some cheer it, others cause languor and lassitude. Of those things that strengthen the body are fine, wholesome food, and light agreeable substances, taken in their proper season and when the need arises, as before mentioned. And those that fatten and moisten the body are ease and comfort, sweet perfumes, eating asafetida and producing sweet and fresh foods, and drinking sweet syrups like wines, and fresh honey with walnuts in times of coolness, without committing excess in any of them sleeping after food on soft beds, in cool places in summer, and warm ones in winter, bathing in warm, sweet water without staying too long in the bath, for that lessens the moisture of the body, smelling sweet-scented plants according to the time of the year, that is, jasmine in winter, roses and violets in the summer, using an emetic three times in a month, especially in summer, 
for vomiting cleanses the stomach and frees it from injurious matter and corrupting moisture, which, being expelled, natural heat becomes more powerful to digest food so that the body will become fresh and full. In this course, a man will derive assistance and increased benefit from joy, wealth, honor, victory over enemies, realization of hopes, amusement, seeing beautiful faces, reading interesting books, listening to pleasant songs, the joking of friends, the stories told by agreeable companions, listening to interesting discourses and amusing tales, wearing colored garments of silk and linen, habitual use of toothbrushes and scented oils according to the time of the year. All these things are especially befitting for kings, because they are easily procurable by them. As for the things that emaciate and dry up the body, they are the contrary to all those mentioned above, namely, insufficient eating and drinking, excess in exertion, movement in the sun and heat, long sleeplessness, sleeping with an empty stomach on hard beds, for heat counteracts the moisture of the body and dries it up, bathing in sulfurous or salt water or cold water in winter, eating pungent and fried foods in the summer and drinking old unmixed wines, likewise excess in purgations, bleedings, and cohabitation, and anxiety, poverty, and fear. Those things that fatten and cheer and add flesh to the body are moderation in cohabitation, eating wheat bread, and the flesh of fat chickens, vomiting every morning with sweetened vinegar in summer, riding on easy-paced cattle and drinking out of new and sweet-smelling vessels. And those that emaciate the body are excessive anxiety and sorrow, wakefulness, occupation of the mind, excessive love, sleeping on the ground, sleeping with old women, and looking at disagreeable and unavoidable sights. But the worst of all are evil thoughts and pursuing anxieties. The Bath O oh, Alexander, the bath is one of the most wonderful things of the world, and one of the most peculiar things which the wise have invented and prescribed for comforting and cleaning the body, relaxing the limbs, opening the pores, dispelling vapors and superfluidities, and cleaning the skin from the remains of sicknesses and pains. And this is because it is built according to the four seasons of the year. The cold part of it stands for winter, the one next to it for autumn, the one next to that for spring, and the one next to that for summer. The right method of using the bath is for the bather to stay for a while in the first apartment, then pass on into the second apartment, and wait there for a while, then enter the third and fourth and so on. And so also he should do when he comes out. He should remain in each apartment for a space, and not plunge from intense heat to intense cold, or from intense cold to its opposite. This bath should be built on a raised ground, and should be airy and should have fresh water. There should be various censers in it, in which incense suiting to the time of the year should be kept burning, that is, in spring and summer, nod or ambergris, of treble or quadruple mixtures, and in autumn and winter, nod of two mixtures and fresh aloe wood. Then he should sit down on a soft cushioned seat and should remain seated there until his body perspires freely. Then he should rub and wipe down his body from time to time with a clean linen or towel. And when that is done sufficiently, he should remove to the bathing place and enter into it. And when the heat gets too strong, he should apply to his body one of the cleaning and purifying soaps according to the time of the year. As for instance, in spring and summer, cleaning soap made with sandalwood and mirobalans, 
and in autumn and winter a soap made with myrrh and the juice of beet. Then he should pour over his head tepid water. Then he should submerge his whole body until all the dirt and filth is removed from it. Then he should anoint himself with some oil befitting the time of the year, and clean some of it off with washing earth or any kind of suitable paste. Then he should enter the other tank next to the first two by degrees, and should emerge gradually as we have directed before. Then he should sit down in the next compartment until his body be dried with towels perfumed with rose water and ambergris. In summer, he should wipe his body with soft linen towels, and in winter, with those of cotton and silk. If he feels thirsty, he should drink about six ounces of the wine of roses and apples mixed with cold water. Then, he should stretch himself a little while looking at some beautiful picture, well-fashioned, or if possible, at some beautiful human being, which is better still. Then he should apply sweet scents to his face and clothes. After this, he should take his meal and drink the usual amount of mixed wine, but not so much as to cause inebriation. Then, he should smell sweet scents according to the time of the year. Then he should go to a soft bed and invoke sleep, but he should avoid cohabitation that day and night, lest this should undo all that we have spoken of, which is most beneficial for health, strengthening to the body, restoring power, and preserving fitness. Then he should obtain restful sleep and pass the remainder of his day in comfort and peace. This prescription will give the body an excellent development. If he happens to be an old man and coldness preponderates in his system, he should stay a shorter time in the bath. But if he happens to be young, and heat and dryness preponderates in his temperament, he should stay there only as long as his body gets wet and receives the moisture of the bath. And if he happens to be middle-aged, he should observe a middle course between the two and use temperate water for washing his body. This is, O oh Alexander, what will make thee independent of every physician if thou dost understand its meaning and find out its virtues. The strength or weakness, seriousness or triviality of diseases and their developments are caused by their crises and influences of the moon on whose strength or weakness depends the strength and weakness of the disease. And in the pulse there is a powerful indication of the state of health, and no one can learn this art except by learning and practicing the feeling of the pulse. And I have noted down its theories in another book. In urine there is another proof of the state of health. An account of it will be found in my book on that subject. Therefore, look for it there, as thou shouldst consult my book on compound medicines and drinks, oils and ointments, according to the schools of Rome, India, Persia, and Greece, and what I have found from my own experience and my knowledge. There is no need to repeat them here. But since I have decided to reveal to thee every secret that I know, I will not hide from thee this medicine which is known as the guard, and it is the mysterious treasure of the sages. I do not know who discovered it at first, but some say it was revealed to Adam. There is another party which thinks that Ascalanus, Nasiurus, Aelin, Duntanas, and Cutarus discovered it, and the philosophers of the eight great sages who fathomed the hidden sciences of the secrets of nature and metaphysics, of the void, and of the fullness, and of the extremes. And they had agreed together on the composition of this great medicine, and they divided it into eight parts. And another party believed that Achnuch had used it by revelation, and Hermes the Great, whom the Persians had named Ahjad, 
and to whom is ascribed every secret wisdom and celestial science. Description of the honey in which the medicines are prepared. Take with the help of God twenty-five rattles, so these are about twelve ounces, of juice of the sweet pomegranates, and ten rattles of juice of sour pomegranates, and ten rattles of juice of sour apples, and one kust of pure rub syrup of sweet grapes, and ten rattles of sugar candy. Put all the above in a clean stone kettle, and cook on a gentle steady fire without smoke, and keep removing the froth from time to time. Boil it thus until the mixture turns into a form of honey. It is the medicated honey which shall be used in the medicines I shall mention, if God will. For the sake of concision, the descriptions of the medicines have been dropped. If you are interested in the recipes, they can be found at page 212. We pick up again at page 217 with a section on times for taking medicines. When thou wishest to take medicine, let the moon be in one of the southern signs, except Capricorn, and let it be close to Venus or Jupiter. Better still if it is in Scorpio or Pisces or in Libra or in the northern signs. Beware of taking medicine when the moon is with Saturn, because it will keep the medicine in the stomach. But the further the moon is from Saturn, the better it is. Although there is no harm in the conjunction of the moon with Mars, it lessens the effect of the medicine. Let the pivot of thy action rest with the well-being of the moon, its absence from the inauspicious stars, and its proximity to the auspicious ones. And now that I have finished describing physical remedies, I am going to mention spiritual ones. Know that mental diseases are also amenable to treatment, but their treatment is carried out by means of musical instruments which convey to the soul, through the sense of hearing, the harmonious sounds which are created by the motions and contacts of the heavenly spheres in their natural motion, which affect the right perceptions. And when those harmonies are interpreted in human language, they give rise to music which is pleasing to the human soul, because the harmony of the heavenly spheres is represented in man by the harmony of his own elements which is the principle of life. Hence, when the harmony of earthly music is perfect, or in other words, approaches the nearest to the harmony of the spheres, the human soul is stirred up and becomes joyful and strong. And one of those things which thou must know, O Alexander, is this, that the soul acquires the power of finding out inner truths by external signs when it happens to be free from lust and pain. This power is known by thought, and when the soul predominates over the body and nothing intervenes between the spiritual substance which lies in the heart and the soul and the animal part which lies in the brain, the intellect is freed from impurities and the object is reflected in it. Hence divination, which is mentioned in many books, and of the truth of which many wonderful instances are recorded. But this also depends upon the conjunction of the stars happening at the time of the creation of this power. Therefore, the science of physiognomy is as much necessary for thee as those other sciences which rest upon conjecture. It is a great science, and the ancients knew it and practiced it, and prided themselves upon possessing it. It is a true science, and I could bring proofs as to its being true were I not afraid of prolonging the discourse. One of those ancients who excelled in this art, and who professed its truthfulness, is Aklimun. He used to tell the character of a man by the construction of his body. 
There's a wonderful story connected with him which I shall relate for thy consideration. The disciples of the learned Hippocrates drew his picture on a parchment, and showing it to Aklimun, asked him to describe his character. He looked at the formation of the body and compared the various parts of it. Then, he said, this man must be deceitful, cunning, and sensuous, and one who loves fornication. Thereupon, the disciples of Hippocrates wanted to kill him, and said, Ignorant fool, this is the picture of the learned Hippocrates. He replied, You asked me to read his character from this picture, and I did so according to my art. When they went back to Hippocrates, they informed him of what had happened. Hippocrates replied to them, Aklimun is right. By God, in all his readings he has not spoken a single untruth. This is indeed my character, and such is my disposition. But when I saw that these qualities were bad, I restrained myself from following them, and my reason overcame my passions. And the philosopher who cannot subjugate his desires to his reason is no philosopher at all. And this added to the excellence of Hippocrates, for philosophy is merely mastering desires. O oh, Alexander, I'm writing for thee a brief description of physiognomy, which on account of thy possessing such good sense and exalted soul, will suffice for thee instead of a longer description, God willing. Thou knowest that the womb is for the embryo, like the pot for the food. Therefore, the whiteness, or the blueness, or extreme redness of the face, indicates imperfect concoction. And if to them is added any imperfection of nature, it is a strong proof of the body being imperfect as well. Therefore, beware of such people, blue or very red and smooth, for they must be shameless, perfidious, and sensuous. O oh, Alexander, if thou shouldst see a person who looks often at thee, and who, when thou lookest at him, turns red in the face, or is ashamed, or blushes, or whose eyes fill with tears, be sure that such a person loves thee, and is afraid of thee. But if he shows signs contrary to the above, he is thy enemy and ill-wisher. Beware of one of a defective make, or having some physical imperfection. The best proportion to construction is of him who possesses medium stature, black hair, and eyes, the latter somewhat deep, set, round face, white mixed with red or moderately brown color, with perfect form and well-proportioned body, head neither too large nor too small, who speaks a little except on necessary occasions, a voice neither too loud nor too low, inclining towards thinness, but not too thin, and whose temperament inclines towards spleen and bile. Such a man is of a perfect formation. Choose him for thy company. Now I shall describe to thee some parts of the body separately, the knowledge of which coupled with that has been mentioned above will enable thee to read character. Soft hair denotes timidity coldness of the brain, and scarcity of understanding. Coarse hair denotes courage and soundness of the brain. Excess of hair on the shoulders and the neck denotes stupidity and rashness. And much hair on the chest and belly denotes wildness of nature, scarcity of understanding, and excess of tyranny. Red hair is a sign of stupidity and love of power and black hair is a sign of mildness of nature and a love of justice. The man whose eyes are large and protruding is envious, shameless, and lazy, and is unworthy of being trusted, especially if his eyes are blue. But one whose eyes are moderate in size, inclined to deepness and darkness, he should be intelligent and quick-witted. But he whose eyes are slanting is wicked. He whose eyes are motionless, 
like those of animals, is rough-natured and ignorant. He whose eyes are constantly moving and revolving is cunning and of treacherous and thieving propensities. He whose eyes are red is bold and reckless. And the worst of all eyes are blue ones of a turquoise color. And if there happen to be white, black, or red spots around them, their owner must be the worst and most pernicious of all mankind. Eyebrows of bushy hair denote impotence and unintelligibility of speech, and if they are united to the temples, the owner of such eyebrows is conceited and boastful, and he whose eyebrows are thin and of moderate length and are black, he is quick-witted. If the nose happen to be thin, its owner is impetuous, and if the nostrils are so long as to almost enter the mouth, it betokens courage. And he who is flat-nosed is lustful, and he whose nostrils are very wide is irascible. And when the middle of the nose is thick, inclining to snubness, its owner shall be vainglorious and lying. But the most symmetrical of all noses is that which is not too long, is of moderate thickness and height, and with nostrils not too far and wide. A wide forehead without any wrinkles in it indicates quarrelsomeness, mischievousness, carelessness, and vaingloriousness. But he whose forehead is of moderate width and height, and with wrinkles in it, is truthful, faithful, intelligent, and skillful. And he whose forehead is of conspicuous protrusion is taciturn and prudent. He whose mouth is wide is brave, and he whose lips are thick and teeth long is stupid, and he whose face is thin is careful in his actions and intelligent. He whose face is small, inclining to sallow, is vile, wicked, deceitful, and arrogant. He whose face is long is shameless. And the best of faces is one with good width, modest-looking, neither too wide nor too small, with soft cheeks, thin lips, good teeth, without having too much hair in beard or eyebrows. He whose temples are protruding and the veins of his neck are full is irascible. He whose ears are very large is foolish, but of a good memory. He whose ears are very small is stupid, a thief, sensuous, and cowardly. He whose voice is strong is brave. He whose voice is neither too loud nor too low, and who speaks neither too fast nor too slow, is wise, prudent, and truthful. He whose voice is harsh, inclining to shrillness, is foolish, but patient in hardship and oppression. And he whose voice is extremely soft, is insolent and ill-natured. But the best voice is one with moderate nasal twang and softness. He whose speech is moderate in harshness and softness, fastness and slowness, is wise, prudent, sincere, good-natured, and of social habits. And he whose speech is fast, especially if his voice happens to be soft, is shameless, foolish, and a liar. He whose speech is harsh, is irascible and ill-natured. He whose speech has a strong nasal twang, is envious and deceitful. And he who is harsh of speech is foolish, stupid, and conceited. He who moves his body too much in speaking or plays with his hands is talkative, shameless, boastful, and deceitful. And he who is grave and taciturn is perfect in nature prudent and intelligent. But one who stammers in speech or minces his words is defective in reason. He whose neck is long and thin is stupid and timid. He whose neck is extremely short is foolish, cunning, and vile. He whose neck is thick is foolish and a glutton. The best neck is one of moderate size and thickness, with conspicuous veins, and with little flesh. He whose belly is large, is stupid, 
ignorant, conceited, and fond of lechery. Thinness of the belly and moderation in the width of the chest indicate courage with stupidity. Crookedness of the back indicates ill nature and low mindedness. An evenness and straightness of the back, prominence of the chest, are good. Prominence of the shoulders indicates evil intentions and bad character. When the arms are long so that the hands reach the knees, it is a sign of courage and generosity, and if the arms are short, their owner shall be a lover of mischief and cowardly. Long palms and fingers indicate aptitude for arts and business and good government. Short and thick fingers indicate ignorance, stupidity, and low aims. Similarly, broad and fleshy feet indicate ignorance and love of oppression, and small soft feet indicate wickedness. The best feet are those of moderate size and symmetrical form, with little flesh, sound nails, and symmetrical toes. Thinness of the ankles denotes timidity, and their thickness indicates courage, and fullness of the calves and ankles denotes foolishness and shamelessness. Likewise, Two full thighs show weakness and softness. He whose steps are wide and slow is successful in his actions and undertakings and prudent for the issue of his affairs. He whose steps are short and quick is hasty in his actions, ill-natured, unmethodical in his affairs, and of evil design. The best of men is one having a moderate-sized mouth, soft and moist flesh, neither too thin nor too fat, neither too tall nor too short, in color either white, inclining to red, or a clear brown color, oval in face, and of even features, hair long, neither too thick nor too thin, of a color between red and black, moderate-sized eyes, somewhat deep-set, a moderate-sized head, straight neck, square shoulders inclined to sloping, moderately broad chest, back and thighs not too full, a clear and moderate voice, smooth palms, long fingers inclined to thinness, grave, thoughtful, amiable, cheerful, so as to inspire others with his cheerfulness and high-mindedness. Therefore, O Alexander, whenever thou findest such a man, choose him for thy company, and for governing thy people and for serving thyself. But thou must not, O Alexander, form thy judgment of a man's character by one sign only, but judge them on the whole. And when thou findest contrary signs, lean toward those that are stronger and more conclusive, so that thou mayest be rightly guided and achieve thy objects by the help of God. End of Discourse 2 End of Part 1 of The Secret of Secrets Read by Dan Attrell